In this last section, we're going to focus on the static keyword, and we're going to focus on two different ways in which we use the static keyword. Um, and the first one I want to comment on was in some of the code that was already here when we started. It's this line of code right here. Private static final string all caps alphabet equals A, B, C, D, so on and so forth. Um, we know this is a constant because we have the, the convention that the variable name is in all caps. Also, we're using the final keyword, which we've studied before. Um, so this is like a private, it's private to the class, so we can't use it outside of the Caesar Cipher class. But the new part we're going to focus on today is by adding the static keyword, what does that Basically, what does that mean? What does that do? Um, because here is a private instance variable, private string key phrase, but this is a private static variable. Um, what's up with that? So let's add a little comment above this to explain what's going on here. And um, the implications of this. So what does the word static mean? The word static in general means the same thing everywhere it's used, but what it specifically means depends on whether it's associated with a variable or a method or other things we're not going to worry about right now. So here it's associated with a variable, um, and what it means in this context is there is one value for the variable for all objects of the class. What does that mean? Um, let's show what that is like and then let's contrast it to what it's not like. Um, what that means is that every Caesar Cipher object we make will have exactly the same value for alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, all the way up to Z, which is kind of makes sense. Like we want the same alphabet for every Caesar Cipher object. That's why we're going to make it make it static. To contrast that, every Caesar Cipher object could have a different key phrase. That's an instance variable, right? So every Caesar Cipher object can be initialized with a different key phrase. That's desirable. Um, we want different key phrases for different ciphers. Um, but every object's going to have the same value for alphabet. So static means there is one value shared for all objects of a class. To be clear, it doesn't have to be a constant like it is here, OK? It could just be a variable that's not a constant. But we want every object to have the same shared value for that, for whatever that variable is. Um, for those of you familiar with Python, this is like class attributes in Python. So that might be a, a handy connection there. Um, we've actually seen this in a couple different places. And I'm going to show you like how do we use these static variables. So static class, so I call this a static class variable. So static class variables can be accessed directly through the class. Because all objects have the same value for these class variables, we don't even need an object to reference it because the value is the same. So the way we could reference this alphabet thing within this user cipher class is we could say Caesar cipher dot alphabet. That's one approach. Alphabet, yep. Um, we've used this before. We can say math.py. Okay. Pi is a static class variable of the math class. We don't need to make a new math object to get the value of pi. We can just say math.py. Which like makes sense. Why would we need a math object? We just want to reference the value of pi. We've also used this since the very first week of school when we said color dot red. Red and all the other colors are static class variables of the color class. That's why we say capital C color dot red, capital C color dot blue. They're static class variables. They're basically super common colors, and so we don't want to have to like create a new color object every time we want red. So the color class has these static class variables already defined for the most common colors, and we can just 
use them. Um, so whenever you see a class name like color um, or math or Caesar cipher followed by a dot followed by something else without parentheses then you know we're focused on hey this is a static class variable. Okay. Um, So I think that's, that's the key thing I wanted to share here. So here's an example of a static class variable. All right. We probably more often see, well, I don't know about more often. So we have static class variables. We also can have static methods. So let's also do an example of that. So we can see how they're similar, but also how they're a little bit different. Um, let's go all the way to the bottom of this file, and we're going to add a static method to the bottom of this file. Um, let's write a java.comment first. So um, Maybe someone wants to use our, wants to create a new Caesar cipher object to do a new cipher, but much like with passwords, they don't necessarily want to come up with their own key phrase. They want to be able to like have our program randomly generate a key phrase for them. Maybe that would be more secure. They're less likely to use like the name of their cat or something. I don't know. Um, so we're going to write a method that generates a pseudo random key phrase of a specified length. So this is like a password generator, really. So we're going to say generates a pseudo random because we don't have a way to make it truly random of the specified length in characters. So we're going to have a couple param we're going to have a parameter here called length which is the number of characters in the key phrase and we're going to return a pseudo random key phrase of the specified length. All right. We wouldn't <laughs> want this method to be a regular method on the Caesar cipher class because in order to create a new Caesar cipher object, we need a key phrase. But this method is going to help us generate the key phrase. So we don't want to create a new Caesar cipher object just to try to call a method to make the key phrase so we can make a new Caesar cipher object, right? Like that doesn't work out. There is nothing that's going to be in this method that needs access to any of the instance variables of a Caesar cipher object. We don't need a Caesar cipher object to write this method. Think of this, this is almost more like what we refer to as like a utility method of a class. Um, it's something related to the class, but it doesn't need an object from that class. And so that's what makes it appropriate to make this a static method. So we're going to say public static string generate key phrase. And it takes one parameter of type int called link. All right, so the key part here is we've declared this method as static. So let's go up above the Java doc and add a little comment here for notes in terms of what does static mean for a method. This method is static, static, and therefore is independent of the state of a Caesar cipher object. That's a, a way of saying we don't need access to and we're not going to use any instance variables. We don't even need a Caesar cipher object to do the implementation of this method. So as a result of being static, this method may be invoked on the class instead of a variable that references an object. For example, we could write Caesar cipher dot generate key phrase. 
Senate, like that. In addition, this method cannot access any instance variables. Static methods can be called directly on the class, Caesar cipher dot generate key phrase. We've been writing static methods since the very beginning of the year, whenever we write our public static void main method. Right? The reason why the main method is static is because we don't want to have to create a new whatever, a new turtle demo object just to run the method that will create turtles. We make them, the main methods are static so that they can be run without creating any new objects. Okay? That's why all Java programs need a static main method. Here's another example of the usefulness of a static method because we could call Caesar cipher dot generate key phrase. That returns a reference to a new string, which is the key phrase, which we could then use to create a new Caesar cipher object. Because static methods can be called directly on the class, there is no this. Right? We can't use the word this inside the definition for this method because there's no object. Right? There's no object on which this was called. It was just called on the class. Because there is no this, we can't reference any instance variables. We can't reference key phrase in here. Okay? Everything we do has to be independent of any instance variables. We certainly can reference static class variables because they're associated with the class as well, but we can't reference instance variables. So something that's going to show up in some of like the practice AP questions are things like, if I have a static method, what can I and can't I access? Um, and so here's the general rule of thumb. If you actually have a real object or you're in a normal method, you can access everything. You can access instance variables, you can access class variables, you can call other regular methods, you can call static methods, you can do whatever you want because you actually have an object. Okay. However, if you're in a static method, there's all of these restrictions because there is no object. So you can't call normal methods. You can't access instance variables. Um, you can only call other static methods and you can only access static class variables. So if you're in a static something, you can only work with other static things because there's no object. That's the general rule of thumb, um, which helps you navigate what you can and can't do. All right, well, let's actually write a little bit of code then to actually um, generate a key phrase, and I want to show you an example of another static method. So let's create a local variable called key phrase, and let's initialize it to the empty string literal. And then I hate to keep doing this to you, but we're going to write a for loop that's going to run length number of times. And this is the syntax for that. For in i equals 0, we're going to count from 0. We're going to keep counting as long as i is less than length. Each time we're going to add 1 to i. Okay, that's, we'll do that all in our next unit. Here's a new method that we're going to call. We're going to call a, another static method. So we're going to call this method. Well, here, let me type it all out and then I'll explain what it does. Math.random. Whew, there's a lot of stuff in this line. Every method of the math class is a static method, which kind of makes sense because we're just going to call functions like random and floor and ceiling and square root and power and we don't need a math object to do that i'm not even sure what it would mean to have a math object right um, so all the methods on the math class are static methods um, and we're going to be exploring some of those today um, one is math.random we already learned about the random object in our previous unit <coughs> um, it was a nice example of an abstract concept um, Honestly, usually we just use the math.random method. The reason why is that it's on our AP quick reference sheet, so we can like read what, how it behaves, and we don't have to remember how next int works. Um, so usually we just use math.random. Here's how math.random works. 
this is worth this shows up a lot so this is worth some notes so the math.random static method returns a double and I'm going to use like our mathematical notation where square bracket means inclusive so the double is between 0.0, .0 and 1.0, 0, 0.0 inclusive, and 1.0 exclusive. So we could get back 0, and we could get back 0 0.9999999999, but we'll never get 1. Okay. We often use math.random to generate a range of random integers. So let's see that. Often we use the following algorithm to generate random, int random integers from min to max, including both min and max. This is like the test question we had in the last unit, right? But now we're going to use math.random instead. Here is the code to do this. So I'm going to type it, and then we're going to go through it step by step. This should look a little bit familiar. Oops, I forgot my parentheses. There we go. So math.random returns a number between 0 inclusive and 1 exclusive. We multiply it by the number of discrete choices we want. And so the number of discrete choices between max and min is max minus min plus 1. We had the same expression on the test. Right? If I want a random number between, let's say, 2 and 12, Right? If I were to count those out on my fingers, I would end up with 11 different values from 2 inclusive to 12 inclusive. Um, so max minus min plus 1 generates how many discrete choices we want. We multiply it by math.random, which means the smallest value math.random gives us is a 0. So this whole expression here could result in a 0. The largest number would be point. 9999999 times the number of discrete elements. So let's say max minus min plus 1 was 10. The biggest value of this expression would be 9.9999999999. It would never be 10 because math.random never returns 1. Okay. What we then do is we cast it to an int. So if it was 0, it would still be 0. If it was 9.9999999999, it become 9, right? We truncate it. And then we add in the min value. So very familiar algorithm to what we did with the next int method, but now we're using math.random and the cast operator to, to turn this off. This line, this code snippet shows up on nearly every AP exam in the free response section. They love this little algorithm. Um, and so like, you know, next next semester, I'll certainly have this like on your little like code snippet like cheat sheet that you can study from. But you definitely need to either be able to just come up with this or maybe for now just memorize it and plug in max and min um, until you get more comfortable with it. But it's something that we use a lot. Um, let's make this a little bit more concrete in the context of why we're doing this times 26. So here's an example. For example, let's say we want to generate a random int between 0 and 25. These correspond to the indices in our string that has every letter of the alphabet. So I'm going to write these all out. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, O, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Whew. Here are the indices. A is at index 0. One. I'm not going to label them all. They're not going to fit anyway. Let's say F is going to be at 5. G is at index 6. And eventually Z 
is at 25. These are our indices. This look better with spaces, maybe. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Cool. So this random integer we just generated here can be used to pick a random letter from the alphabet, which is kind of cool. So we can actually use this randomly generated letter index to build up our key phrase. We'll say key phrase plus equals. We're going to concatenate on the key phrase. Caesar cipher. So we're going to use alphabet here. Alphabet. So that's our cl static class variable we defined up above. So Caesar cipher dot alphabet. I can't use this. I'm going to call the substring method. And I'm going to specify letter index is where I want to start. And letter index plus one is I'll stop just before that. So if I want a single letter using the substring method, I specify the index and I specify the index plus one. And then we'll just return key phrase. So I like this example because we just wrote our first static method, other than the main methods we've been writing. Inside that static method, we're calling the random static method of the math class, and we're using the alphabet static class variable of the Caesar cipher class. So we're seeing both how to define a static method, how to call a static method, how to reference a static class variable all within like one little example. So that is what static is all about. Let's actually run this code because we've been working on it for so long. It'd be nice if it actually works. So I'm going to run the main method, which is static, of the Caesar Cipher demo. We'll bring up the terminal text to encrypt. Um, I don't know. This is our super secret message. Enter the key phrase. Um, what's a good key phrase? I don't know. Roman Empire. Here it is encrypted, which is cool. And we can even create a new Caesar cipher. We can actually call our generate key phrase method shows up in the BlueJ menu here because it is static. We don't need to create a new Caesar Cipher object. I can just directly call the generate key phrase thing and say I want a key phrase of length 8 and it randomly generates this key phrase for us, which then I could like copy and, and use if I wanted to. So that's kind of neat too.